Young royals marrying regular people, in many cases making the monarchy perhaps seem a little bit more accessible. But in doing so, is the notion of royalty being lost? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. relationship between a prince or princess and a civilian. Once almost unheard of, not totally, we'll go into that. It is now a much more regular occurrence. But what does that mean for monarchy per se? What it stands for and how it presents itself to the world? It's what fairy tales are made of. A royal meets and falls for a regular member of the public. Meghan Markle, soon to be a duchess, had a normal upbringing in America. She's an actress and already well known, so the spotlight is nothing new. But how will she fit in to royal life? A so-called commoners like Meghan Markle changing the face of the world's monarchies. An American actress and divorcee with no royal experience. Hi. I'm Rachel Zane, I'll be giving you orientation. Congratulations! Meghan Markle and Prince Harry represent Britain's modern monarchy, where a good love match means more than an elite bloodline. Some see their engagement as a turning point. That wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. It wouldn't. Divorced, black, American, no. So, times are changing. Attitudes in the House of Windsor have moved on since King Edward VIII caused a scandal with his choice of bride. He abdicated the throne in 1936 to wed American socialite and divorcee Wallace Simpson. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. Grace Kelly is perhaps the most famous and glamorous actress to wed a royal, giving up a successful career for Monaco's Prince Rania in 1956. Natasha Alieva was a hotel maid from Belarus. She married a sheikh from the Dubai royal family. Even Britain's Kate Middleton lived a somewhat ordinary life as an accessories buyer for a retailer before marrying Prince William. In Japan, the royals maintain their traditions and Princess Mako is giving up her title to marry a commoner for love. With young princes and princesses choosing partners outside of royal bloodlines, are they slowly changing the very nature of monarchy? By making them more accessible and perhaps most importantly more marketable, or is the notion of royalty being diluted and soon to be irrelevant to the modern world? With me at today's round table, we have the historian Anna Whitelock, author, author of The Queen's Bed, an intimate history of the Queen's Court. We have the royal author and journalist Claudia Joseph. She's written Kate, The Making of a Princess, and Thomas Mace Archer Mills, the chairman of the British Monarchist Society and Foundation. Warm welcome to every one of you. Claudia, shortly after the engagement was announced, uh, you said it's extraordinary how far we've come since the 1930s. It's changed beyond all recognition. Clearly, we're referring simply to the, to the British. Mm. Monarchy. In what way has it changed? Well, if you look at what happened with Edward VIII, I mean, it, it, he was not allowed to marry a divorced American woman. And now we see Prince Harry, um, 70 years later, 80 years later, um, having chosen not only an American and an actress, which, um, you know, wouldn't have been allowed either, but um, she's divorced and, and she's Afro-American. So. That is an obvious change, but yeah. in, in the way the monarchy is perceived or the way that it, it works itself, how else has it changed? Well, I think they're much more accessible, aren't they, the, the royals, than, than they were in, in previous eras. So Queen, I think, has, has got the balance right. I mean, she is accessible, but she's also, she's not one of us. I mean, William and Harry have, have been educated at school as, as opposed to with governesses, they've been to university and they have a lot of friends in the real world and, and obviously mm -hmm. Prince William is, is married to a, a commoner mm -hmm. and, and you know has lived in a flat in university, he's, he's got friends, he's had parties, he's 
you know, they've done everything that we all have done. See, I'm fascinated by the fact you said the Queen's got the balance right, but is, is the Queen worried about where it's going? Well, I think it's also important to say that, of course, Edward VIII was king um, at the time he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, and she was um, divorced and actually still married and divorcing. So I think mm. we're looking at a quite different situation. I mean, Prince Harry is fifth in line to the throne, soon to be sixth in line to mm. the throne when the new royal baby's um, born. So, I mean, it's a very, very different prospect. I mean, I think even if you know, Prince Charles was thinking about marrying. I mean, indeed, when he married Camilla, the Queen didn't attend that wedding. She attended mm. the blessing. So I think we have to be quite careful that we don't draw direct parallels between, you know, King Edward VIII and Prince okay, Harry. But do you yeah. think the Queen's worried about the war? Does she of course. lose I, sleep over it? I don't. I think the Queen is... First of all, I think the Queen, in relation to Harry and William, acts as a grandmother. I mean, I think she clearly was there very much looking and protecting them at the time of Diana's death. So I think we have to think that the Queen is acting as a grandmother. She sees that Harry is happy and settled. And I think, you know, we shouldn't disregard that kind of human instinct. Um, I think also, you know, I think it was quite interesting in that first um, engagement interview that the uh, will, um, that Harry and Meghan gave that you know they were talking very on message they were talking very strategically the fact that they talked about the Commonwealth I think was a really savvy move mm. because they're talking about carving out for themselves a sort of niche role which will actually support the the monarchy and the royal mm. family so I don't think the Queen I mean who knows but I can't imagine that the idea that Meghan is um, you know is mixed race, is an actress. I mean, she would definitely have had very com wise conversations with Harry about what Meghan's letting herself in for, but I, I don't think she's losing sleep massively do, 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 over do it. Do you think it's changed for the better or the worse? I think it has changed for the better. And when we look at this, uh, the addition of Meghan Markle is the absolute treasure trove for the royal family. I mean, we can look at history and we look at how Edward VIII responded, how Wallace Simpson responded, but it's a very different world today. Mm -hmm. So when we look at a changing face of Britain, when we look at social uh, fluidity, really, we're, we're really now looking at a changing face of the monarchy, just as we are the changing face of Britain. And adding in an, an addition of someone of colour who, who actually owns that and is very proud of it, the Queen is a steward, number one. She's a grandmother second, and she takes her duty very, very seriously. So I think that when we look at what Her Majesty might be thinking, of course it is the survival of the institution. And change stops, starts from the top down and stops with the person who takes over But, but the danger is here, and each one of you mm. may have an opinion on this, is, is Walter Badgett in the yes, yes. Quite, that's 19th obvious. century. A constitutional expert, famous mm. writer, said, do not let the light shine in, yes. because otherwise yes. you're going to destroy it all. I think yes. this is exactly the problem. I mean, I think when we say, you know, what's good for the monarchy is one thing, and, but when we talk about, you know, the monarchy moving on and reflecting the times, you know, the monarchy is an anachronistic institution. You know, the idea of having this strict hierarchy in a world where, you know, privilege, um, and, and not being, uh, um, you know, born into a role rather than earning it through merit is very much at odds with society. So, you know, I think it's very striking when we sort of applaud the fact that William and Harry are somehow like us and, you know, mm. Prince William, you know, shops at Waitrose and he puts Prince George when he was born into the car like any other new dad. This is all he very well. He did too, didn't he? Because he was fumbling yes. with all yeah, of the yeah, seat yeah, yeah, like yeah, we've all done. Yeah, and this is great, but the, <coughs> there, will, there will come a moment when... William is crowned king. And I think what part of the problem in all of these discussions that we have at the moment is that we haven't had a coronation for most mm. of our living memory in, yes. in our lifetime. And so the reality of what the monarchy actually is hasn't been in our faces, and it just seems like a kind of nice celebrity family. But the monarchy is fundamentally premised from the top on the notion that in the coronation, but in the anointing, that the monarch is stood above the rest of us. Yes. So, yeah. so in, in yes. making it more ordinary, as, as we are ordinary, are we in danger of doing what yes. I just said and destroying well, I, I what think, it is? I, I think very much in danger. That's yes. why I, I said that I thought the Queen had got the balance right, because I think that William and Harry are, are very keen to be popular and that they have sort of got very confused as to what their roles are. I, I think one of the classic examples with, were the photographs of, of Kate sunbathing in, in the south of France. You know, William went ballistic about it. He got the lawyers in. But 
in the south of France, of course, they're just, they're just celebrities. They don't care um, that we have a royal family. They're not interested. They're lovely pictures of, of the Duchess of Cambridge, some bathing topless. They'll make a fortune for the photographer. And, and that's what they think about. And I think William has to accept that, you know, he may have a, a very sheltered life and they have a gentleman's agreement with the press or have growing up. Um, obviously, it's, it's not so it's strict as it was. But I mean, I think he has to accept that, you know, in this country, you know, he is in a very powerful position, but in other countries, he's, he's well, a celebrity. Let's talk about the changing role of mm. what's expected of a royal in a moment. But Thomas, let, let me ask you about this. If the light is shone upon the monarchy, why is it going to go wrong? Or why could it go wrong? In other words, if they, they come across as more accessible, ordinary people, where, where's the danger? To a point, and there's a fine line between being royal and being celebrity. And when we shine the light in, we lose a bit of that mystery, that mystique. Mm -hmm. We lose the, the special brand of magic that is monarchy in this country. We don't want to see the inner workings. We don't want that. We want something fun and nice, something that we're putting out, something that's pomp and pageantry and shows the mm -hmm. best of Britain. We like shiny. We like the glitz. We like the glamour. But when we get into the internal workings, and see, it's like going to Disneyland Paris mm. and going through the tunnels and you're like, well, this just takes everything out of it. I can, re I can remember one particular so, occasion when somebody said, wow, that's extraordinary. We're seeing what they're like. And it was Prince yes. Philip invited the, the newsreel cameras to come in and watch him mm. cooking a picnic for the family. Yes. I think it was yes. at Balmoral. Yes, yes it Balmoral. was. And yeah. they were yes. very criticised for that documentary, weren't the they? The Windsor's yes. royal yes. family. It, I think there's also, I think, a generational question here. I mean, I think when Thomas talks about, you know, we, we love the kind of fun of it. I mean, when I talk to my students, my undergraduates, they, you know, they, they like feel, it. first of all, they have very little opinion mm -hmm. on the royals. And if they're sort of, if we do have a discussion about it, they feel like they do not want the royal family rep representing them. They feel mm. that it's, it's a completely anachronistic institution. And I really, you know, I really feel that people have a, you know, the queen belongs in many ways to a sort of bygone age. Now, the, the reverence mm. of the royal body, which actually is a long-standing historical notion. I mean, it used to be that by, by the laying on of hands that it was believed that the monarch could actually heal scrofula, tuberculosis. And we still have with the queen that lingering sense mm -hmm. of... Is it going to go when she goes? Well, I mean, if you think about it, the, the, the international outrage, if you remember when the Australian yes. Prime Minister put his arm around her, and indeed, oh. I think mm. Michelle Obama, uh, yes. you yes. do not Obama. turn your back on the queen. Now, when Never. you think about Prince Charles, you know, we all know quite a lot about his, you know, his body. That his body doesn't yes. command the kind of reverence, and I think that there's this. It's just not the same anymore. <clears throat> so I, I really feel like there's going to be big questions when the Queen yeah. dies about its and, usefulness and, and its relevance. And, and the difficulty of a commoner marrying into royalty is perhaps that they don't understand the same rules that the others no. have all been brought up with, which is in the British monarchy's mm. sense, you do not dabble in politics. You don't really have opinions. Well, Prince right. Charles. Well, you say Prince. Yeah. You say well, this is this Prince is where we're Charles going again. Not king yet. Prince Charles. He's not king. I know, but how can you take him seriously when he is king if he's already putting his views, you know, out there? And, and look at Meghan Markle. She said very clearly what she thinks of Donald Trump. Now, how is that going to sit when she's a member of the royal family? And you, you can't take your words back in this current era. We've got Twitter. We've got Facebook. We've got and everything's all over the internet. Yeah. In, in previous eras, if you made a gaffe. You know, perhaps it would be in newspaper cuttings, but well, we don't know what the Queen thinks about things. You know, when the no. Queen might have kind of like, you know, maybe even just suggested that she was and you know that she was very opposed to the Scottish referendum, yes. just basically yes. by the, an odd sort of sniff or a wink. It was massive news. We don't yeah. know what she thinks, and you know, the fact is, we know Charles's opinions on all kinds of things. Mm. Now, maybe there's a way in which the monarchy can evolve, and I think it's important to realise that over history. The monarchy is underpinned both by tradition but also by subtle evolution. I mean, there has always yes. been a bit of make do and mend going mm. on. So I think we need to, you know, coronations have had to change a little bit. Things yes. have had to be tinkered with around the well, edges. It's changing so. with the times. And mm. the, the institution, what's special about it is that it does change. Its survival is based on change. And that's what we're seeing and, here. And do other royals in, in different countries, because they've often married into non royal bloodlines, uh, quite a lot of it happening at the moment. Do other royals, do you think, have the same problems? Because their roles are entirely different, aren't they? I think you've got to remember that the Queen was head of the Commonwealth and, and, uh, and she's a bigger institution than a lot of yes. European and monarchies, I think. And, and head, head, of head of the church and head of the armed well, forces. Head of state and, of 16 and, and, exactly. nations in total. Exactly. And I, I think that 
gives her a certain gravitas that perhaps the other, a lot of the European monarchies went through this, well, we saw it, Princess Grace. Well, they're not like and, us. And, and See, continental Empress. monarchies, they're not coronated. Mm. They're invested and inaugurated. We look at the, uh, the Dutch. Well, so do you help me here, what's the difference? Well, the difference is when we look at our institution, we have a grand occasion where in front of God and the country, where we have the royal motto, Dieu et mon droit, God and my right. It's all about the anointing. Uh, exactly. Mm. Crucial idea. Whereas when we look at continental monarchies, yeah. yes, of course, continental monarchy, monarchies don't have that. Uh, when Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands went ahead and abdicated, again, something we don't do, uh, for her son Willem mm. Alexander, there wasn't a coronation. She's an effective, you just resigned. Like rather than mm. Yes, of course. Crisis, yeah. But it's the same now. We're looking at Japan, case in point. Mm. The first emperor ever to go ahead and say, well, I'm going to retire on this date and abdicate my throne in 2019. It's, it's a very different composition mm. for royal families mm. around the world. We, 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 should, we should mention at this point that, uh, Thomas, you're an advisor to a couple of royal houses in Europe, Serbia, I think. Yes, I, I work closely there, there, there are no, no kings family. or queens yes, in those countries at the moment. But right, what, what, de facto how king. Do, how do you advise? Well, what do you, yeah, that's what, what, I what do you advise them about? Well, we, we look at some um, recognition. We look at uh, public support for it. We look at their charity. They're giving how they're actually re-establishing the brand within the country. And case in point, Serbia, over 70 plus years of not having a monarchy, coming out of the throes of communism, where everything was just destroyed, and then the war back in the 90s, mm. the only thing that really could bring the people together and bring democracy back to Serbia was the king. So the government went ahead, reinstated uh, not the royal family, but made them citizens, brought them back, or letting them live in their ancestral palaces, and take on certain aspects of social life which is actually letting people rally round their king and have another purpose to come out of the dark days of communism and regain what's important to them as Serbian people. You're either PR for them or you're a fifth columnist. Yeah. And some people must see you as an insurgent trying to re-establish I believe in constitutional monarchy. <laughs> but I think, I mean, the point that you make, I think, is an interesting one because, of course, I mean, we have seen in this country the rebranding of the monarchy from the sort of Victor Victorian idea of a family monarchy, yes. you know, being the kind of ultimate family. And then, of course, you know, not least in the 90s when the Queen's children were, you know, their marriages were in meltdown. Yes. Then, you know, that whole notion of the, the monarchy as being about the principal, you know, family no longer really held currency. So now what we've seen is the kind of evolution of this whole notion of the welfare monarchy, this idea about charitable work and being defined mm. by you know, yeah. um, good causes do. and what they do. And I think, you know, the work clearly, I mean, the, one of the best things to kind of engage young people is the work that, you know, William and Harry have done with mental health, yes, with the Invictus course. Games, yeah. all of these kind of things. So, you know, that is important. Are, are they sort of following on from uh, Prince Albert's? example of, of being, if, if you like, a, like a moral authority mm -hmm. for the country and then, then uh, setting an example to the nation as to, quote, mm. how it should behave. Well, I think to a certain extent, I mean, it's, they've been slimmed down as well. I mean, Prince Charles has made it very clear that he doesn't want his siblings and their children mm -hmm. involved in, in the monarchy. I think maybe that might be a mistake because that puts the onus on them. And if things go wrong, of course, there aren't, there isn't the support. Um, I, I think that William and Harry are, are very keen to take out over their mother's role to a certain extent. And I think it's, it's of, maybe it's branding, but I think a lot of it is, is down to wanting to recognize their mother. I mean, we saw the, the television interview with them um, recently, which I personally think was quite a mistake. Uh, I, think they, I would agree. They gave oh, so tell much. Us why. Tell us why. Well, you, because I, I watched just, it, I have to say, I thought I saw two young people very much in love. Either oh, you want the media or you don't. And I'm, I don't mean to speak over you, but uh, please carry on. Well, I, I just think that they are talking about their... F I mean, it's very difficult because mel mental health obviously is a very important issue in this country and, and they are highlighting it. But to talk about their own feelings about the death of their mother and, and the detail... I mean, we, as you said earlier, we don't get that with the Queen. We don't know what the Queen thinks about anything. We all, 
you know, William that's and Harry were known. Of it. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. the life. That's and why and I we come back to the central question. Yes. If, if you marry outside the royal family, and we, we were talking beforehand, yeah. what, 1462, Edward IV <laughs> did it in and the 1700s, 16, you yeah, said? 1660, um, the future James Six, II. Yeah. And, and it doesn't and happen very often in this. It's the last commoner, I think, to marry into the If you, well, marry a future if you king, bring commoners in, yeah. Us types. If, if you well, it's not us types. Though. Well, right I mean, maybe it's there. more they your type. It's that. not my type. I wouldn't be. I mean, you know, we're talking about. I think it's. I mean, William and Harry but have a very are. small group of friends. But then it can go wrong. But can't it? it can. But they have a small group of friends, and they those friends have been a kind of conduit to these other people. And, you know, Meghan was introduced to Harry by one of his very select group yes. of friends. Mm. So I think you know this isn't about William and Harry being in a nightclub and sort of you know meeting some random girl there. This is you know there. It's within a kind of social media. But it is accessible. I mean, yes. you, you say it's not your life. Actually, it is my life because I was private school ed educated. And, and it, it's, it's very easy if you mix in private schools to, to meet the royals. And, yeah. you know, I went to parties. Yes. In fact, Helen Windsor Gate crashed my brother's birthday party. So, I mean, you, you know, and you think... Nobody if, asked us to leave. If <laughs> I actually, it was very embarrassing, but do you want the story? Go on. Um, I went up to her thinking, how dare someone get crush my brother's birthday party? So I went up and said, who are you? And she said, Helen or whatever. And I was like, who invited you? And then I went away and I felt guilty because I was like, oh, I've been really mean. So I went back and she must have thought I'd found out in between who she was and, and changed oh, wow. my mind. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but my point You're off is the that... List. Well, I know, it's <laughs> terrible, isn't it? But uh, my point is that, you know, they are, uh, there are a lot of girls, I mean, obviously not the whole population, but there are enough people that think, well, if Kate can do it or Meghan can do yep. it, then I can do it. And George and Harry are now, uh, okay, they're exclusive private schools, but they are, they're all mixing, you know, in previous eras we saw, obviously, governesses, they were educated in-house, so to speak. So they weren't mingling with, and, and, yeah, I mean, it's and, and meeting different There's people. There's another side to this, though, isn't it? We've talked about perhaps the dangers of bringing in somebody mm. from outside, but what about the bonuses, the pluses? Somebody who might be able to say to Harry, no, no, please don't put that silly uniform on. You're going to get snapped by the photographers. <laughs> and that's what she's going to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you, it, it could have a, 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 pl and, and a plus side He is a very unconventional British prince. Mm. He's lived his life his own way he's done his royal bit his own way so this is not a union coming that I was shocked about I was actually rather delighted I know. and said finally knowing what we do about her this is directly in line with the way Prince Harry wants to live his life he wants someone who's unconventional who's fun who is a little mm. outspoken the same that he is and I think we're going to see wonderful things but we cannot forget that no matter what the younger royals do they must have granny seal of approval. The time has rattled on. We are coming close to the end of the program. So how about this for a, for a final thought? Um, will it be the making of the monarchy or perhaps the start of the end of the monarchy? I don't think Meghan's going to make or break the monarchy, that's for sure. I think that there is going to be a whole question about whether the monarchy can mon uh, modernise, what that looks like, yes. and whether it can survive in its modernisation when the Queen dies. I mean, that's going to be the big thing, because I think for, for a long time, the support for the monarchy has been seen as actually synonymous with support for the Queen. When yes. you take the mm, Queen yes. away, the sort of, you know, the approval rating for the monarchy, I think, will, you know, go massively down, yeah. because they're not one and the same thing. So it wouldn't have mattered whether he married into a royal bloodline or no, whether he married Meghan so. Markle or, no. or whatever. No. No. See, we need to start educating about the pluses of the institution and what it's here for its constitutional foundation of what we actually live within this parliamentary democracy that we enjoy and the fact that they're we so don't educate yeah they're so monarchy. distant from mo so many things Bajot also described this as yes, a secret republic and perhaps mm. that is yep. the secret and as well, in isn't it? Australia they sometimes say Australia is a crowned republic but I, I don't want that for this country we need proper education about the pros and also the cons of constitutional monarchy if we don't have it what happens to our system? If we take the petrol out of a car, does it continue to run? It doesn't. It's I mean, of course, we, what, we, yeah. you know, what we unfortunately don't know is quite you know, the wisdom that the Queen shares in her yes. weekly audiences with, you know, you know, with the Prime Minister. I mean, yeah. you know, the fact that her first Prime Minister was Churchill, 
you know, the Queen is mm -hmm. the best kind of example of, you know, continuity and yes. experience and wisdom. And I'm sure she's had a huge impact in the political life of this country in a way that we don't of know. Of course she has. Claudia, she ha as we come to the end, go on. Wrap well, it up, since you're the only I one think... I know who's insulted a royal. <laughs> 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 and hangs out with them. Well, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I think you've got to remember the Queen has trained William um, very well. He used to go to tea with her every week at, from Eton um, at Windsor Castle. And, and I think he is very much trying to emulate her. And I think you see that a lot with the way William and Kate behave. Um, Harry is not going to be king. Um, we've had Princess Margaret. We've had Prince Andrew. I mean, he's not going to be as significant anyway to the, to the royal family. Obviously, he's a royal. But I mean, I think you have to look at Prince Charles and Prince William and, and see how the future lies from there. Yeah, I suppose at the end of the day, and by the way, thank you very, very much indeed uh, for coming on the programme. It, it, it comes down to the fact that although they've married Harry and William commoners, mm -hmm. they are not no. commoners no. themselves. But they bring something special. Thank you. Yes. Thank special. you very much thank indeed. You, uh, they yes. may wear the crown. It's whether they command respect and whether those people that they decide to make part of their family do the same thing that will determine whether the institution of monarchy in this country, Britain in particular, but also worldwide perhaps, will continue into the 21st century and beyond. For me, David Foster, and my guest, thank you very much for watching Roundtable. Hope to have your company next time.